Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It's great uh, to have you all worshiping with us uh, this morning. Um, I know it's been an empty campus uh, since yesterday, but it uh, feels great to be a little bit on a break. Um, so we'd like to welcome everybody uh, here uh, to our worship service uh, this morning. And uh, I know this, uh, this season, um, for a lot of us, we're getting a lot of visitors coming um, to spend the holidays uh, with us. But uh, I love celebrating this time of season because it's a good reflection of the reminder uh, to us uh, what our mission is um, for as for why Christ came here uh, to save us. So as our tradition, um, let's all stand and greet each other. A happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Who's ready to worship God this morning? Amen. Let's all stand for our opening hymn. O oh, come, all ye faithful.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, being with us here this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit tabernacle among us, that we may live here with a changed heart and a renewed mission to serve you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We have, I know we have more boys and girls than the, just these two darling ones up here. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. We've got one more little girl here. And all of you look so pretty. The little girls all in their dresses and the boys all dressed up. It's almost Christmas, isn't it? Okay, well, I have a story to share with you this morning that happened a very, very long time ago, probably well over 100 years ago. And this is during the time where people used horses and wagons most of the time to get around. Only the very rich people could drive a car. Did you know that there was a time that, that we didn't even have cars? Okay. Well, this story is about a couple, and they got married, and they lived way, way out in the mountains. And they had their own chickens for eggs and they had a goat that they milked for milk, and they had a big garden, and every, every summer they would pick all their vegetables, and they had fruit trees, and Ma and Pa loved living out there. It was beautiful, and they had a little girl and a little boy, and where they lived in the mountains, it would get very cold and snow. Have any of you ever lived where there's snow? Anybody here? You have? Okay. Well, if you've ever lived where there's snow, and I sure did, I lived in Colorado, every now and then you get what's called a blizzard. Do you know what a blizzard is? Okay, it's where it's really cold and a lot of snow comes down. And you might get so much snow that you might be snowed in. And if you're snowed in, guess what? You don't go to school. Yeah, that's the good part. You don't go to the store. You don't go anywhere. And that could be for three days or more. Well, during this time, it was about three days before Christmas. And Ma and Pa were inside building a fire. And it was very cold outside. And the snow was coming down. The horses were in the stables, along with the goats and the chickens. And then 
all of a sudden Pa said, oh no, I didn't realize our firewood is almost all gone. Pa had cut lots of trees down in the summer to, for firewood, but they were getting low on wood. And Ma said, you know what? I was afraid to tell you, but I'm almost out of flour. I don't think I'm going to have enough to last the week to make our bread. And the little girl and the little boy said, thank you, sweetheart, said, oh, no. Well, what are we going to do? I thought we were going to get to go into town and go shopping because it's almost Christmas. And Ma and Pa said, well, we're not going anywhere because there's a big storm coming. Sure enough, that night the snow fell, and in the morning when they got up, the snow was up to the window sills in their house. They could look out, and it was snow everywhere, and they realized they couldn't even open their door barely to get out. So they thought, oh boy, we are stuck here. And so Ma said to Pa, oh, I feel so badly because I really was hoping we could get to town in time to buy a little Christmas gift for our children. And Pa said, well, we'll just have to wait and see if the snow melts. Well, day one went by, day two went by, and there was still too much snow for Pa to go hook up the wagon and hitch up the horses to go into town. So they went to bed that night, and the next morning, they, their dog started barking. And their dog only barked when someone strange was coming to the house. And they thought, who could be coming out here right now? There's too much snow to get anywhere. And all of a sudden, they heard some noises outside. They looked out the window, and there were two very large draft horses. Those, are, those horses are bigger horses than most people will ride. They're the big horses that pull heavy wagons. And uh, hooked up to their harnesses was a big wagon, wagon, and this man with a big fuzzy beard and a big heavy coat got out of the wagon and came to their door and with Pa's help and this man's help, they got that door open. And the man said, I'm here to bring you some supplies. We heard that you were snowed in and thought you could use some things. And Ma and Pa said, oh my goodness, that's wonderful. So the man brought in a big box of firewood. How did he know they needed firewood? We do not know. Then he brings in a second box. And Ma and the little girl opened it up, and inside was flour and sugar and fresh eggs and some vegetables and fruit. And in the bottom of the box, there was two boxes wrapped up in Christmas paper. And the little boy and the little girl said, look, there's presents. Who could these be for? And the man that had brought in the box said, I don't know, somebody put those in the box when I was loading up the food. So the man said, listen, I got to be on my way. I have another home to visit. So he got into his wagon and those big draft horses hauled away that big wagon and off they went. And then Ma and Pa looked back and their little boy and girl were opening the boxes with the Christmas paper on them. Inside one box was a, was a dolly, and the little girl said, Oh my goodness, this is exactly what I've been wanting, a new doll. And the little boy opened the other box, and inside that box was a train set. And he'd been always, always wanting a train set. They'd never had the money to buy a train set. Mom and Pa couldn't believe it. They had food, they had some Christmas presents, they had firewood. And Ma said, oh, let, let's give that nice man something good to eat on the way to his next house. She had baked some cookies earlier, and they opened the door, and they went out. Guess what? The wagon was gone. The horses were gone. And the thing that's the most amazing of all is there were no tracks in the snow. There was no prints from the horse's hooves or the wagon wheel. And they looked, they looked left, they looked right, they looked everywhere. There was nothing in sight but snow, trees and snow. And they thought, how could this be? Well, Pa looked at Ma, 
and he looked at his son and his daughter and he said, I think we just witnessed an angel bringing us supplies because there is no sign of anybody out there. They couldn't believe it. But you know, God does miracles. And certainly that's what happened. He had sent an angel in the form of a man and he had brought them the supplies they needed to hold them over and including included with the supplies was a lovely Christmas gift for both the boy and the girl. Isn't that a wonderful story? It reminds us how much Jesus loves us and how he will take care of us. So as this Christmas time comes, I know you're all going to have some Christmas presents from your mommy and daddy and from other family members. But just remember, the best, best gift of all is what God has given us long ago, and that is the gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus came in the form of a baby long ago in a manger in Bethlehem. And Jesus is in heaven right now making a new home for you and for me. And someday we will get to see him. And that will be the most beautiful gift of all is to have our eternity with God and Jesus and the angels in his heavenly kingdom. Thank you and have a blessed Sabbath and have a very merry, merry Christmas. You can go back to your seat.
believe that the angels on that night were just praising God for his great sacrifice on that cross. Let's see what sort of the angels sing. Let's sing what the herald angels sing.
That was lovely, amen. Our scripture this morning will be found in Micah chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Word of God reads, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor's, labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. Well, good morning to everyone. I don't know about you, but it's already been a rich blessing just to be here so far. Um, I especially love that song. Christina Rossetti, one of my favorite uh, Victorian English poets, wrote the words to that. And she asks that great question, what can I bring him? And as if our hearts were nothing to bring, yet it's everything. Um, so I just, I love the... The ending to that where it says just bring him our hearts and I hope this morning um, as we journey a little bit towards that important event that we will indeed be bringing our hearts let's bow our heads Heavenly Father I just thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to worship you to think particularly of um, the gift that you gave us not just of your life here on earth, but the opportunity for each of us to have eternal life with you in heaven. I pray that you will bless us during this time, and then as we go out to celebrate those gifts with our families and our friends in the week ahead. In your name I pray this, amen. Way back when the world was brand new, God looked down at all that he had made, and saw that it was good. It pleased him, made him happy, for now there was yet another world where he could share companionship and joy. For a while he found comfort in walking and talking with his friends in the garden, and they found security in his love. But then sin and separation. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden as Satan and the angels had been banished from heaven. God no longer walked and talked with them, and loneliness em entered the world and the heart of God. They all were suffering, and they needed a way back to each other. You know the story, and you know the plan. You know that in order for us to live eternally, Christ had to die. God so loved the world that he would give up his own son, and that son... He, too, would love the people in the world so much that he would give up his life for them, to suffer that others might live, to deny himself for those who are dearer to him than life. That is the true meaning of love. And that, that in the end, was what would bring humanity back to be united with their God. But wait, I'm getting ahead of our story, and it is our story. Let me take you back to a night long ago, more than 2,000 years, in fact. In many ways, it was a night like any other. The stars were shining, but one in particular. In other ways, it was like no light, no night, no other night. For the events that followed would change the world forever. There were many travelers on the roads as the census had been ordered, and all were encouraged to return to their home villages to be counted. That included Joseph, the carpenter, and his betrothed, Mary, heavy laden with child. They were on their way to Bethlehem. If you were one of those other travelers and did not already know their story, you might wonder how Mary was heavy laden with child without the protection of marriage and why she hadn't just stayed home, given her condition, instead of travel so far afield. But God had given several prophets the story to share with the people of their time, people like you and me. You should have known, I should have known had I been there. 
From Isaiah, you would have heard the promise that God would be sending relief from the oppression of the world, that the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. From Malachi, you would have heard a more fleshed out prophecy, one that also addressed you or someone like you. I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the message of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. The prophet Micah had even foretold where this great event would take place. You would have heard of Bethlehem and its ironic significance, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are too small to be among the army groups from Judah, from you will come one who will rule Israel for me. He comes from very old times, from days long ago. The Lord will give up his people until the one who is having a baby gives birth. Then the rest of his relatives will return to the people of Israel. Isaiah had commented on the state of the world, its sin and its need of a savior and how this baby born of a virgin would supply all their needs. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So yes, they knew. If they had been paying attention to their prophets, they should have known. And yet when they read in Isaiah this challenge, they were not sure what to do. Comfort my people. Comfort them, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to it that its time of hard labor is over and its wrongs have been paid for. It has received from the Lord double for all its sin. Go up a high mountain, Zion. Tell the good news. Call out with a loud voice, Jerusalem. Tell the good news. Raise your voice without fear. Tell the cities of Judah, here is your God. Later, after the Savior had come and gone, the writer of Hebrews would describe the news from the Old Testament prophets and its fulfillment this way. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. So when it came time, for the prophecy to actually be fulfilled, people knew or had the opportunity to know. They knew and so did you, if you had been a traveler on the road to Bethlehem that momentous year. Yet in spite of everything, it still was a surprise. No one saw it coming. Those of us living a couple thousand years later can read what happened. Luke gives us the context. During Elizabeth's sixth month of pregnancy, he tells us, God sent the angel Gabriel to a virgin who lived in Nazareth, a town in Galilee. She was engaged to a man named Joseph from the family of David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Greetings, the Lord has blessed you and is with you. But Mary was very confused by what the angel said. Mary wondered, what does this mean? The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, because God is pleased with you. Listen, you will become pregnant. You will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and people will call him the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of King David, his ancestor. He will rule over the people of Jacob forever 
his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, how will this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will cover you. The baby will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. Matthew shares his perspective on the story, saying that the birth of Jesus Christ happened like this. When Mary was engaged to Joseph, just before their marriage, she was discovered to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Whereupon Joseph, her future husband, who was a good man and did not want to see her disgraced, planned to break off the engagement quietly. But while he was turning the matter over in his mind, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. What she has conceived is conceived through the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to a son whom you will call Jesus, the Savior, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. All this to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Luke explains how it happened that Mary and Joseph found their way then to Bethlehem. About that time, Emperor Augustus gave orders for the names of all the people to be listed in record books. These first records were made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to go to their own hometown to be listed, so Joseph had to leave Nazareth in Galilee and go to Bethlehem in Judea. Long ago, Bethlehem had been King David's hometown, and Joseph went there because he was from David's family. Mary was engaged to Joseph and traveled with him to Bethlehem. Just imagine that journey if you were Mary. You are traveling a dark road on a cold winter night, unsure of any immediate plans, but you are positive of the momentous future that lies ahead for you and the child you carry, the child of God. Imagine the anxiety of both Mary and Joseph and what they must have felt as they traveled that road on their way to Bethlehem. Imagine the frustration of the innkeeper um, who was overrun with guests, desperate to find shelter from the cold winter night. Imagine what it was like for him to have to tell this clearly needy couple that he had no place but a manger for their soon to be born child. Luke concludes his birth narrative like this. And while they were there, she gave birth to her firstborn son. She dressed him in baby clothes and laid him on a bed of hay because there was no room for them in the inn. Now my imagination tells me it was a lot more dramatic than this, but that's what we have from Luke. Years later, the child born that night in a stable would stand on a hillside and proclaim that the meek shall inherit the earth. And it was the meek who first heard the good news, the good news of Jesus' birth, the good news that we continue to celebrate today as we walk our own road to Bethlehem. It was the meek that were among the first to hear the good news of Jesus' birth as the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks in a field near Path on the way to Bethlehem. But on this night, it was not just the meek that were on their way to Bethlehem. Indeed, the road was lined by shepherds and their flocks, but also carpenters and innkeepers, strangers and friends, paupers and even kings. Step by step and prayer by prayer, people came from everywhere on their way to Bethlehem. Every creature, great and small, journeyed to that humble stall on their way to Bethlehem. Luke goes on with his story, recounting something even now challenging to imagine. Now there were shepherds nearby living out in the field, keeping guard over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were absolutely terrified. But the angel said, do not be afraid. Listen carefully. For I proclaim to you good news that brings you great joy and to all people. Today your Savior is born in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. 
This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a vast heavenly army appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among people with whom he is pleased. When the angels left him and went back to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place that the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off and located Mary and Joseph and found the babe lying in a manger. When they saw him, they related what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were astonished at what the shepherd said. But Mary treasured these words, pondered them in her heart, what they might mean. So the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Everything was just as they had been told. Amazing, right? Imagine what it must have been like to be one of those shepherds, realizing that you had just witnessed the fulfillment of a prophecy, knowing that you had wondered if it would ever come true. You knew the promise, and now you knew the delivery of the promise. Amazing, right? As 21st century Christians, we travel a well-worn path that leads us towards life everlasting. Our path was started by the sandaled feet of a humble carpenter and hooves of a gentle donkey that carried the mother of Jesus. Our path was paved by the eager steps of all who have come to worship him and all who believe that in a lowly stable, in a tiny village, the savior of all was born. In the beginning, the word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. So the Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Christmas time then celebrates this love, this gift of life, this reunion with God. We often tend to think of Christmas as more for children than anyone else, and perhaps there's some truth to that. But isn't there a little bit of the child in each of us? And isn't it the birth of a child? that is at the heart of our celebration. Christmas is a celebration, and celebration is instinct in the heart. Through how many centuries now has that need in the heart found comfort and fulfillment in the Christ child? Through how many threatening circumstances has Christmas been celebrated since that cry came ringing down through the ages? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Christmas is celebration, but the traditions that cluster sweetly around the day have significance only if they translate the heart's intention, the yearning of the human spirit to compass and express faith and hope and love. Without this intention, the gift is bare and the celebration a touch of tinsel and the time without meaning. Faith and hope and love are the wellsprings, firm and deep, of Christmas celebration. These are the gifts without price, the ornaments incapable of imitation, discovered only within oneself and therefore unique. They are not always easy to come by, but they are in unlimited supply, even in the province of all. And so I ask you today, 
Are you on the way to Bethlehem? Just like many years ago, you and I can also go on our way to Bethlehem, hand in hand with God above, filled with his eternal love. We're all on our way to Bethlehem. Dismiss us with your presence 